Hello, in this tutorial, I'm going to be talking about how to uh, make a simple particle effect and then turn it into a procedural and then use path tracing with that to achieve a kind of watery look. Uh, so the first thing I'm gonna do is make a simple particle effect that looks kind of like some water drops. So I'm just gonna grab a particle root node and drag it into the graph and link that to the root with control R. So it auto links. And uh, we don't need as many particles for this. So 64,000 by default, I'm gonna aim for about 2,000. And then uh, for an emitter, I'm just gonna emit from a sphere. So just drag this primitive emitter into the graph and then by hitting control R, it automatically links to the particle root node. And uh, because I wanna see what I'm doing initially, I'm going to just drag a point renderer into the graph as well and link that to the root. If I press play, you can see I've got like a nice um, ball of particles already. So let's change the default settings here. Uh, we don't need as large a radius, so we're gonna make a smaller ball. And I'm gonna make them emit on the surface of the sphere rather than from the, um, rather than all the way through it. So now we've just got a sphere of particles on the surface. And uh, we're gonna do a one-shot effect here. So they need, they need to run once. So turn off respawn and uh, turn off all the life randomness. And let's make them all emit pretty much at first. So if we do that now, you see they all pop in at once and reduce the fade time. And let's make them fade out. So now we watch that back and they slowly fade, they all pop in and they slowly fade out together. So it's very controlled. So the next thing I want to do is make them behave a little bit more, or a little bit like a fluid. So for this, we're going to use the SPH of fluid effector. The SPH effector, we just drag that in and link it to the particle root node with control R. And this makes um, particles behave as it, so they affect each other like they're all part of one big fluid. So if you press play, see what happens. They all kind of just uh, burst apart and fall down. And that's because there's gravity on by default. So I'm just going to take that off. That's a bit more like it. So now they, um, they're they pushing each other just straight outwards now. Um, so I want to make this much slower. So let's take down the pressure scale. So now they're moving much more slowly. We can give them some surface tension and they'll pull on each other to kind of keep more of a homogenous form. Now we need a bit more pressure scale. So we need to balance these two things. Working with them, fluid effects is inevitably a balancing act of parameters. So now we drop that down a bit. And then the, the cell size here is the, um, the radius in which particles affect each other. So we can bring it, if we bring it very large, they have a much wider effect. They'll push each other apart much more. Bring it down a bit and they'll have a smaller effect. So I kind of say we're getting there on this effect, on this one now. So now instead of little points with a point renderer, I want to turn this into something more like a meshed fluid surface. So the way to do this is with a procedural. So we grab a procedural root, drag it into the graph, hit Control R, and we're gonna use the particles to uh, turn into a procedural. So we grab a particles generator for procedurals, hit Control R, hit Control R a lot, don't we? And it's linked to the procedural root node. Now the particle root node links into the particles, particle node. So this is now generating procedural surface from the particles. And if we use a procedural meshing node, we'll actually turn the whole lot into a mesh. So if I look at the normals, you can see that I've actually got like a whole surface mesh made from the particles. So I'm gonna say goodbye to my point renderer for now. Um, there's a this area of space that's uh, meshed or contained by the procedural is uh, managed using a bounding box node. So if I drag in a bounding box, you can see that's the area of space that is currently contained. Hook that into the procedural root and also into the particle root. And this one, uh, at this moment, this is a little small. So let's just scale that up to about two, something like that. Now, if we run that, you see that roughly, we've got some very big particles here, way too big. So let's turn them down. Instead of, um, instead of, at the moment they're spheres, but let's turn them into blobs. So with blobs, they all kind of, they kind of blob together like metables. There we go. And uh, it gives them some randomness. We want them all to be the same size. 
And already we're getting there, made them softer blobs and a bit of error tolerance as well, just to make sure that the mesh is reasonably continuous. So now we've got these, uh, all the particles have turned into a blobby surface. This doesn't really look that much like a water drops yet. So the next trick is to go to the procedural meshing node and use the smoothing iterations parameter. And what this does is a mesh smooth on the generated procedural mesh. So now I've got something that looks a bit more like a blobby surface. So let's mess with that um, smooth iterations parameter. So if I just increase that a bit through, see I'm getting a kind of uh, a more meshed surface now. There's one other node I can use to manipulate this. If I use the melt node, the melt node smooths off the procedural. So if I change, and let's link that into the procedural root. And that one, uh, instead of union, we want it to replace, because it's gonna replace the surface. And I can control how much that affects the surface with a bit of a distance offset. And this makes from, for a smoother, kind of more um, fluidy surface there. There we go. So I, don't need, I only need this to look good for a few seconds because I'm working on what I want to be a still image at the end here. So I'm going to run it to about four seconds in and go back to default render. Now it's time to start lighting this and making it look a bit more like glass or water. So um, I'm going to start lighting this and I'm going to light it using a sky dome. So in order, for, in order for this to work, we have to turn on deferred rendering in the root node and high dynamic range. And I'm going to use linear space lighting as well to work in linear space rather than gamma 2.2. Two. And then I'm going to import my sky dome. Just go to my uh, project directory. So here's one I've uh, downloaded earlier. It's an HDR sky dome map. I'm going to use this with a um, the skylight to a dome, which is a dome light. So we use the environment image node as the source for the HDR. So if I expand that, you can see that that um, has loaded in my HDR. And then the skylight is going to actually use it as the dome. You see without the, uh, without the HDR, it's just an ambient occlusion kind of render. And when you pop the dome light on, it's using a dome, sky dome render. He's using that as the texture. See, I pop the thumbnail with shift, double click. So this is kind of a very diffuse look. It doesn't look anything like uh, glass or water or anything like that. So in order to start making this look shiny, the first thing I need to do, I need to turn on ray tracing in the root node. So here is the, uh, if you go to the root node and pop on ray tracing, and I can go to the skylight and switch it to ray tracing mode. And you see, I get a very similar look, but now it uh, looks noisy and refines. The um, so this is very diffuse at the moment. But let's change, start changing the material on the meshing node to get a shiny look. So go to the material. So we start by trying a metallic material. So I'm going to drag a metallic material in, hook it to the procedural meshing node. You see now I've got a um, metallic uh, reflection. Render. You can see you've got lots of. Um, you can see the dome reflection in the uh, in the blobs. So if you want a sky dome to actually be visible, you just go to the skylight and check on visible sky dome. There we go. So you can see what's happening here. We, we've got we're getting one um, one hit into the sky. So it's so the rays are casting out from the geometry and they're either hitting the sky or they're hitting something else and they're just coming out black. I want this to actually bounce around. I want lights to bounce. I want the light to actually bounce around and get fill in these black areas. So in order to do that, I need uh, a node to give me bounce lighting. And for that, I want the path tracer node. The path tracer handles all of the indirect lighting. So pop it on and see what that's done. It's immediately um, giving me multi bounces. So lights now bouncing around from the things that from the sky dome hitting things bouncing around and filling in those um those black areas there you go let's dim that um we don't need that sky dome to be quite as bright now so this looks very um terminator right now 
Um, now, instead of a metal look, let's go for more of a glassy look. So I'm going to take that material out. And go and grab a glass RT material. And pop that onto the procedural meshing instead. And instantly you can see that some of the blobs have become translucent. You can see through them. And that's already given me a kind of watery look. The, um, the obvious issue is that we've got all these dark areas. And that's because the, there are not enough bounces um, on the set on the path tracer for the rays to make it all the way through all the blobs and get to the exit. So it'll get to the, the HDR the other side. They're terminating too early, so they're just coming out black. So we need to go into the, the path tracer node and bump up that refraction depth. Let's try eight. Let's try, let's try going up slowly. So five, six, eight, 15. Do you notice any difference between eight and 15? Very tenuous. Let's leave it at eight. The more bounces, the slower the render. So I really like to avoid having more bounces than I absolutely need. Already this is kind of get, getting more of a, um, more of a more of a look. You see that the rays are making through, so it looks kind of very it looks see through. The glass RT node has some nice options we can use. Um, we can make it rough, which is not right for this look. And we can also mess with the IOR so we can change it so it's more uh, more towards straight transparent. So if we use one, it's completely just transparent. And if we bump it up we're going to get more of a kind of watery, nice look. Let's leave it where it was. We can also control the, um, the specular intensity. So um, we could bump up the uh, highlights so they're a bit brighter here, just by going up. I think we also need some more glossy bounces on the path tracer. So with just as we needed more, trans more refraction bounces, we need more specular bounces as well with the glossy depth. And the, the number of bounces here is going to take the max of all these values. So having more glossy uh, bounces doesn't massively increase our render time when we've already got a lot of um, refraction bounces. So this is, this is coming together a bit. Now, the let's dim that down slightly. Let's give a little bit of tint to the water. It's a little bit too bright at the moment. So now you can see that this is um, this is pretty clean already, uh, but because of the skylight, there is a little bit of um, noise in the render, so it has to refine. So you can see these um, refine steps going up here as I stop and let it move around. But this ref the render doesn't actually change that much. So the noisy render versus the refined render, it doesn't massively change. It's a nice thing with glass and really shiny, hard metallic mirror-like surfaces is that they don't need that much refining to look good. Um, just because they're already, the rays are already pretty much all going in the same direction. So you don't need loads of uh, refining to um, get that nice spread of noisy rays. But what is a problem here is this image is really aliased. So I'm going to use the RT refinement node and drag it in. And this enables me to control the number of refined steps, which I can drop down to 100. But what's really nice here is it add, gives me the ability to set up some anti-aliasing. So there's a few ways of anti-aliasing things in Notch. Um, we've obviously got the root node anti-aliasing option, which you may be used to already. If I pop that on, you see this does have an effect, um, but it, it ne neatly deals with edge anti-aliasing, but only edge anti-aliasing. So the edge of the polys will become anti-aliased. But to be honest, a lot of the noise and aliasing we're getting on this render is from rays, not from edges of geometry. So it's not really helping us that much. But what it does do is it really increases the render time a lot. So you see by popping that off, I've, um, I've quite considerably dropped my render time from uh, 90 milliseconds to 50. Really big, really big drop, just by turning on off anti-aliasing. There's a couple of other options though. We could try, um, we've got FXAA which is uh, a reasonable solution actually, but it just blur, it does blur quite a lot. So if you hide that on and off, it's dealing with the edges quite well, but it's blurring things out a lot. And then we have temporary anti-aliasing. And if we link that to the root. Temporary anti-aliasing 
normally is a really great solution, but unfortunately with procedurals and particles, so it works really well with still images, but unfortunately with procedurals and particles, um, the motion of those cannot be calculated accurately. And temporal AA relies completely on motion. So it's okay for a still image though, but for any kind of motion, it's not going to give me an accurate result. You see, it's just giving me these kind of blurry trails. It's kind of affecting itself, but in this case, not quite what we are after. So I'm going to hide that as well. So actually in practice, the note I really want to use here is the um, the AA option on the refinement node. Let me pop that on. And what this does is it uses the refine passes to um, do anti-aliasing. So each refine pass is calculated slightly differently, which means that they all get a slightly different AA result. And it means that you, over time, you build up this really nice anti-aliased quality to the image. You can see that's working quite well. That's smoothing out all the um, all the aliasing on the image. Even have a few more iterations, why not? See, that is uh, giving me a much cleaner render. If we pop that, zoom that out a bit. So it's noisy when I play, but as soon as I stop, see it quickly refines. And uh, when we render this to video, it's all gonna be really clean. There we go. And uh, all that will be left now is to uh, tweak that simulation as much as we can and uh, tweak the drop look and get the best possible look. But the nice thing about this is, of course, is that I can go back to my uh, particle sim while, um, while rendering it and just tweak the look while looking at the render. So hopefully this shows that it's very easy to mix all the traditional notch tool set like particles and procedurals with the path tracer to um, get a really nice, really nice rendered quality to your dynamic interactive scenes. Thank you very much. Thank you.